So let's turn, uh, we're going to look at several scriptures this morning, with, uh, some Christmas thoughts here. So uh, go ahead and turn with me to Matthew chapter 1, and we'll look there first. So when we think about the Gospels, so, you know, we got like four Gospels, right? So we got Mark, Matthew, we got Luke, and then we got John, okay? And so um, Mark, he, he just starts off with his gospel right in the adult ministry of Jesus, gets right into the baptism thing. John, he goes all the way back to creation in his prologue, but then he goes into the baptism thing and right into the adult ministry. Luke, no. Matthew, no. So when you're, think about this now, when you're a writer in, in the first century um, you're Luke you're, you're Matthew and you want to introduce the one who is the Messiah of the Jewish people and of course all, of all the Gentiles the whole world how are you going to do that how are you going to set it up so that when the readers read they go oh this is Jesus this is, this is the Messiah this is the Savior of the world this is the son of David. How are you going to know that? How are you going to introduce him like that? So we have uh, the pedigree of Matthew and, um, and Luke. Now, if you go over to Luke, to Matthew chapter 1, uh, which you've already done, and I need to do that now. You see all these names here, right? You think that's a Christmas story? You know, you read all these names. This guy beget that guy, and that guy beget that guy, and it goes on. And if you're like most people, when you when you start off in Matthew, you just skip it, don't you? Right? You just say, why is that even in there? What's interesting, of course, and I've shared this with you before. Who would have thought? That two year, two thousand years after Jesus was born, that this text, along with the pedigree in Luke chapter three, is the text that wins to the Lord Muslims in Africa more than any other text in the Bible. Who would have thunk that, right? And why is that? Because ancestry is so important to them. Your authority is gained by where you came from. Who was your father? Who was your grandfather? Who was your great-grandfather? And if you can go back 10 generations, you're probably chief. So when they read this text, and being a Muslim, they already knew about David. They already knew about Abraham. And so in Luke... The pedigree goes all the way back to Adam. Well, they know who Adam is. And Jesus is a descendant. And so when they see that, they go, we don't know anybody that can go back like that. It has a line like, he must be God. And so they become believers. So, But for us in the West, we read this and we just want to skip over it because these names don't necessarily mean anything to us. Well, when Jesus came into the world, the Bible says in the fullness of time, <clears throat> I, I just want you to know God had a plan. And it was a well-oiled, thought-out plan. When Jesus came into the world 2,000 years ago, it was anything but ad hoc. And it was finely tuned. And so I want to I want to show you something this morning and I want to go probably a little slower than I normally do because I want to make sure you get this. I don't really care about whether this was eloquent or not, not that it ever is or that it's flowing out of my mouth or all that. I want to make sure that I I go slow and I get you some of these finely tooled um ingredients in the incubator that brought our Lord into this world incarnate as the God man 
And so Matthew does, um, he, his pedigree is different than Luke's. So when Matthew does his pedigree, he's going to start up here, um, the book of genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. He's going to start with Abraham. He's going to do like a 14, 14, and 14. He's going to omit some names. He's going to do, uh, which is different, he's going to do something else that's different than Luke. He's going to put uh, four women uh, in his genealogy. You just didn't do that. You put women in there, it's suspect. And the four women that he's going to put in his pedigree are all, um, well, it's bad enough that they're women, okay? But they, they're, they're Gentile women. So uh, you've, got, um, you've got Tamar, uh, and Rahab, they're both Canaanites. You've got Moab, you've got Ruth, excuse me, excuse me. She is from the ancestry of the Moabites, which came into the world through incest. And, uh, and then you have um, Bathsheba, who we believe, uh, pretty, have pretty good reason to believe she was a Hittite. And so you have four women who are also Gentiles, um, they can be looked at as from the four periods, uh, from the patriarchs, uh, from the conquest, from the judges, and then from the throne of David through those four different periods. And there's something else they have in common. Anybody know? They were sinners, right? All of them were involved either directly or indirectly in sexual sin. And so, so part of this pedigree, part of what Matthew's trying to lay out here for is that God came for everybody. He came for sinners. We're all sinners. We all have sinned before God, and we all need a Savior. So, so that's certainly part of what he's doing, but that's not what's most important. So what, what Matthew does is he works his way down from the, the covenant of Abraham and Abraham's life, and he, all the begats, and he, he gets down to David. And then he keeps going, and before he gets to um, Joseph, he goes down another 14 from David, and he gets to a guy by the name of Jeconiah. I think that's in verse 12. So Jeconiah is in verse 12. Okay. And then he goes um, another 14, and he'll get to Joseph. And so uh, here's, and we, let's just read this verse here in verse 16. And Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. Now remember, Matthew is writing primarily to a Jewish audience in the first century. He is trying to say, or he is saying, Jesus Christ, who is Jewish, He's God. He's the Savior of the world. This is what he's trying to do. So the thought has been, well, he's trying to say that, um, yes, Joseph is not his father. You know, we have the virgin birth. And so, but he's the adopted father of Jesus. And so Jesus being the adopted son of Joseph, Joseph being in the line of King David, has the royal right to the heir uh, to be an heir on the throne. Okay, that's been kind of the standard operation. And I'm going to say no. I don't think so. I'm going to say I think he's saying just the opposite. He is saying in this text that Jesus Christ is in no way, shape, or form in any kind of relationship to Joseph directly. No way. And why would I say Matthew would make that kind of statement? Because of verse 12. Verse 12 needs to be highlighted. One name in verse 12 needs to be highlighted. And that name 
we come to understand even better in Jeremiah chapter 22, beginning in verse 24 and all the way to verse 40. Jeconiah was their king of Judah when Nebuchadnezzar came with the Babylonians and sacked Jerusalem. And there God, through the prophet Jeremiah, cursed Jeconiah. Oh, it was a terrible curse. He said several things. He said, you're going to get taken off into Babylon. You're going to become a slave. By the way, you're not coming back. You're going to die there in uh, Babylon. And if that's not bad enough, God told him, and before he told him, I think it's in verse 29, God called out to the entire earth to hear this curse, and he said the earth three times. He said, earth, earth, earth. I don't know that I've ever seen that in the Bible before. In other words, God must be pretty mad. And here's what he says to Jeconiah. He said, you are cursed so much that you'll never, ever have a son that will reign on the throne of David. And guess who's in the lineage of Jeconiah? Joseph. There's no way that Matthew is trying to align Jesus with Joseph in any way, shape, or form. In fact, he's saying the opposite. Joseph is under the curse, but how did Jesus come into the world? Well, if he didn't come naturally through Joseph, how did he come? I mean, how are you going to come if you don't have a natural father? And so here he tells us this. He solves this riddle for us because one cannot be in the lineage of Joseph, but yet one needs to be born. How are you going to do that? Verse 16, And Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. Now we also see here, verse 18, uh, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Um, verse 20, uh, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. So this virgin birth was, was done of the Holy Spirit. And, but in 16, he wants to make sure that the readers in the first century catch this. Of whom is a relative pronoun. It's genitive and it is feminine. Him is men. It's, she's, it's feminine, man. It, so the of whom can only refer to one person here. Mary. Mary. So, so what's happening here? Well, Matthew is fulfilling for us. He is showing how it is fulfilled. I mean, God's doing it. He's just displaying it for us. So he's going back to Genesis 3.15 when God spoke to the serpent and he said, between your seed and her seed will be enmity. You will, you know, get a hold of his foot, but he's going to crush your head. What's going to crush the serpent's head? The seed of the woman. And so God then gets more specific in Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14 when God says, a uh, long story, uh, Ahaz was king. He's in big trouble. Uh, the kings, the two kings in the north, king of Assyria, the king of Syria and the king of Israel want to depose him and uh, and take over and, and put a new puppet in, uh, in place of Ahaz. In other words, they didn't want to just get rid of Ahaz. They wanted to get rid of the dynasty of David. It ain't going to happen. Because now, as, a, as bad as Ahaz was, now you're coming against God. And God says, let me tell you what's going to happen. Because when God makes a promise, he's coming through. He's faithful. And he says, let me tell you what's going to happen in response to what they said. And he's going to use 
not just the you singular when he speaks to Ahaz, he's going to use the you plural. So he's going to speak to all of Israel. And he said, there's a sign coming. There's a sign coming. And it's going to be that a child is going to be born of a virgin. And that word that the, was used in the Greek Septuagint is exclusively used for the word virgin. And if anybody knew how to translate the word Alma from the Hebrew, they did when they wrote 200 years before Christ. And it wouldn't be much of a sign if just an, a woman who gets married has a baby. But when a virgin has a baby, now we will look out now. And so now we see what, what Matthew's trying to say. He's trying to say he didn't come from this cursed lineage through Jeconiah. He came through the Holy Spirit who planted the seed with joined with the egg and Mary and became God incarnate. Okay, well, to be the Messiah, though, you do have to be from the lineage, physically, from David. Well, if he's not from the lineage of David through Joseph, and we know he's not, I mean, especially since he's born of the virgin birth here, but if he's not, he's not coming from Joseph, well, then how does he become the Messiah? How do we prove that he is really the King of kings and Lord of lords, that he's God incarnate, and he has the right, the royal right, to sit on the throne of King David? That's where Luke comes in. So I want you to mosey on over to Luke, and let's go over to chapter 3. And we're going to look at verse 23 in just a second. So Luke's a little different now. He's going to, he's going to start here with Joseph. Well, that ought to throw a signal up, flag up, right? He's going to start with Joseph right here in verse 23. How can he do that? Uh-oh, uh-oh. Just hold on. He's going to work all the way back to Adam. Now, he's going to do it a little different than Matthew. He's not, here's what's going to happen. He's not going to put any women at all in his genealogy. Because he doesn't want his, he doesn't want any of his Jewish readers to, to put his pedigree at, at any kind of question, any kind of caution. He wants to make sure that he's right in line, locked Barrel and step with all the other Jewish folks of his time and the way they did their pedigrees. And so he's only going to mention men. Now, we already noted he can't come from Joseph. So if he can't come from Joseph to show that he's in the lineage of King David... Who's he going to have to show that he came through? Mary, thank you. We only had two choices there. But wait a minute. He wants to show that Jesus came from Mary, but he can't mention any women's names. How's he going to do that? Well, let's just back up for a minute. So if you were in the first century and you wanted to trace the genealogy of your mother or your grandmother or your great-grandmother, you wanted to do that yourself, how, how would you do that? How would you start that? You're not going to use your mother's name. You're not going to use your grandmother's name. You're not going to use your great, great, wherever you're starting, okay? You're not going to use, wherever you're starting, you're not going to use the woman's name. What are you going to use? You're going to use the husband's name, the father's name. Right? Now, if you come later on, like Luke did, he's over there in the temple, 
He's researching the pedigrees. They're all over there. And by the way, this all has to happen before 70 A.D. Because when the temple was destroyed, all the pedigrees, all the genealogies, they were all burned up. They're all gone. There's nobody that can prove they're the Messiah today, even if they do live in New York City. That's a joke, man. So if you're Luke and you come later on and you want to prove the pedigree of Jesus, how are you going to go in there? Because you're not the one that traced it. You're coming in years later. How are you going to know whether it's from the father or the mother? Because the mother's name's not mentioned, even though it traces sometimes from the mother and not the father. How are you going to know? Come back next Sunday. <laughs> huh, got you, didn't I? Just making sure everybody's awake here. Okay. Now I want you to notice something in this, this pedigree that Luke does. We start over here in verse 23 goes all the way down to verse 38. And we have the word beget. And notice he it's just all men. The the you know the son of Math, the son of Nagai. And this um is only mentioned for men, and every single, let me back up, in in English, uh, you have a definite article, say in this case, uh, this would be Ha Joseph. So in Greek, if you were reading, it's a problem if you're reading this in English, you would not be able to know this in reading this in English. You would have to be reading this in Greek. You're in the first century, and here's what's going to happen. In English, we don't do this. We don't say, if I was to say Mike is... Uh, a good speller. Okay? If I were to say that, in English, we would not say, the Mike is a good speller. We wouldn't say that. We don't have definite articles in front of um, personal names, okay? But in Greek, it's different. It's very different. In front of every personal name, you're going to have um, the definite article, right? In front of the in front of the name. Here's what I want you to see. It's Luke, he couldn't be more clear on what he's trying to say. Every single personal name in the Greek text from verse 23 to verse 38 has a definite article in front of every single name except one. Would anybody like to guess what name that is? Joseph. Joseph. You see, now... When you're reading the text in Greek and you see this man's name without the definite article, you now know what to think. And what would you think? This is not the father's pedigree. This is the mother's pedigree. 
And so when Luke's doing his research in the temple and he comes across this pedigree and he sees Joseph's name, it doesn't have the definite article in front of it. And he knows this is from Mary. Now, we still, are y'all with me so far? Okay. Now, we, we still haven't established the problem. We've still got to solve this problem because of Jeconiah. So we now know this is Mary's line, but we still have this problem of Jeconiah, don't we? No, we don't. Can anybody find his name between verse 23 and verse 38? You'll be hard-pressed to do it. Well, what did he do? Did he just delete his name? No. David had more than one son. Solomon was his son through Bathsheba, but he had another son, and what was his son's name? That was in this pedigree, that was in the line, not of Joseph, but of Mary. His name was Nathan. It's right here in the text. I want everybody for their, right before your Sunday afternoon nap, I want you to read this pedigree in chapter 3. And then you can go right to sleep. <laughs> Nathan's in there. And because she comes through Nathan, and Jesus is born through who? Mary. The seed of the Holy Spirit joined with the egg in her womb. He is a direct, that is, he being Jesus Christ, he is a direct descendant of King David and therefore has the right to rule on his throne forever and ever and ever because he came through her and she came not through Solomon, not through Jeconiah, but through Nathan. And this is confirmed when we see in chapter 1 with Gabriel in verse 26, chapter 1 of Luke. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. Uh, none of the archaeologists believe there ever was a town called Nazareth until 1962. It's just a bump in the road. And um, in 135, when they had the Jewish revolt again, the Romans came and sacked Jerusalem again. There was a priestly family that left Nazareth and went to Caesarea Maritime, and there in uh, stone uh, they wrote the name Nazareth. And so now nobody um, is out to disprove there was no Nazareth. This angel Gabriel was sent there by God to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb, bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great. He will be called the son of the highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And he had the right to do it because he came through Mary, who came through Nathan, who came through David. So I say all that to say that read your pedigrees. There's stuff in there that's important. And as we close, you know, uh, I just want to say that uh, nobody could have figured all this out before it happened. It was clouded in mystery as God moved along in the Old Testament with Genesis 3 and Isaiah 7 and finally in Matthew 1 and in Luke 1 and Luke 3. And I just want us to remember as we think about the great detail that God planned in bringing his son. 
He did so for you and for me. God is faithful. This problem was nothing for him to solve. And that should be an encouragement to you and to me. Because I just bet there's somebody out there today with a problem of their own. And you can't see the forest because of all the trees. Listen, if God can bring his son in the way that he did, whatever problem you got is just peanuts. Our job through the Christmas message is to be encouraged to trust God more. To put your faith and dependence upon him and reject and refuse any of the worry, the fear, and the doubt in your life. God is faithful. Let's pray. And let me just give you a, <clears throat> a moment or two to pray about your own life. Maybe there is some obstacle in your life and you don't really you can't see how to get through it listen god god's here the invitation is to trust him not to doubt him but to trust him let me just give you a minute or two to voice your own little prayer to the lord about your own faith. And as you're praying, maybe there's someone here today who needs to make a decision for the Lord. Maybe you want to ask the Lord to come into your life. Boy, I'll, I'll be here. I can help you. Matt can help you. We can help you during the invitation. If you want to stand, come down. If you want to talk about it after the service, you say, Mike, I want to know that I know that when I die, I'm going to go to heaven. I don't want to just know about Jesus coming to the world, becoming the God-man, dying on the cross, being buried and rising again from the dead. I want to know him personally. We want to help you with that so that you can know him, know that you have a personal relationship with him. And if somebody wants to pray and ask the Lord to come in your life right now, I'll just stand right here. We'll have an invitation. You can just stand and come right now as we're praying maybe someone else has another decision they need to make whether to join the church or rededicate their lives or follow the lord and believers baptism whatever it is i'm just going to stand here just for a moment or two stand up and come <clears throat>